Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good? Can we all stand? Everyone's kind of quiet this morning. Good morning. There we go. Let's come before the Lord in prayer and Lord, we just, uh, we come before you, Lord, to worship you. Lord, we come, Lord, to respond to your goodness, respond to your grace. Lord, that you are worthy, Lord, of our praise and worthy of our lives. And Lord, we just come and we spend this time this morning offering ourselves to you, that you would speak, Lord, that you would move, and Lord, that we would sing these songs, Lord, from our hearts to you, lifting you up. Lord, that you would be exalted in this place, Lord, in our lives. And, and so we just come before you and we, we give you thanks for the amazing grace that you've poured out upon us, that you've given us life and that you've given us peace. And we come with hearts of thanksgiving, of thankfulness. And we just lift you up. Thank you. 
Lord, that's our prayer, Lord, that you would, Lord, lead us, Lord, in your love. Lord, as we grow, Lord, and Lord, really we love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Lord, we then translate that, Lord, to one another. And as your ambassadors here, Lord, that we want to, Lord, be filled, Lord, with your spirit, Lord, your goodness. And we do sing, Lord, that you are holy, Lord, that you are worthy, Lord, worthy of all the breath that we could ever breathe, the songs that we could sing. Lord, we just lift you up, Lord, to your rightful place in our hearts, Lord, that you sit on the throne of heaven, Lord, sit on the throne of our hearts this morning.
Lord, we do praise you this morning that we are in awe of your goodness, of your grace. Lord, that we do owe all to you. Lord, you have paid our debt of sin. Lord, you have forgiven us, given us life. And this morning, Lord, we, Lord, as we open up your word, Lord, speak to your people. Lord, prepare our hearts to receive and to respond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel. Let's take some time to greet one another. You guys doing okay? All right, all right. Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel. It's a great day to gather together and praise the Lord. Any day that Christians get together to praise the Lord is a nice day, and uh, that's kind of what we're made for. Um, and those times of fellowship, those times of, of nearness between believers, uh, they do speak towards what our forever is going to be like in glory. And so what a special time to uh, just get used to that, getting used to being in the presence of others. I know there's, we have these insecurities, these fears to, that we don't like to get close to one another. Um, we don't like to, like, you know, be known. But nonetheless, uh, that's God's intention for us, community. So anyway, I just have one quick announcement, and then we're going to dive into our study today. And that one quick announcement is that out there in the foyer, there's sort of a, a petition now, it's not like a political action or any of that. This petition is simply, there's a, a movie that's been put together. It's getting ready to be released. And it's going to be released, you know, throughout the nation. But, you know, the, the owners of the, the theaters out here, the manager, they're not sure whether or not there's going to be enough interest to, you know, show a movie like this. It, it's called I Can Only Imagine. And it's a testimony of one of the guys from the band Mercy Me who wrote that song that you've probably heard before I can only imagine and it's been put together really well and so with that you know the the local management they just want to know that there's interest on island to even bring a movie like that in so all that they're asking for is just your name and your email and then we could submit that petition to the local theater and then they can kind of make their evaluation on that so that petition is out there in the foyer it's on the bookshelf so you'll see it on a, um, on a clipboard. Just go ahead and write your name and your email on that. And then that way we can submit that. I mean, a lot of the different churches on island, they're doing that right now. Just to like, hey, you know what? There is interest for this kind of stuff. You know, you don't have to just, you know, show, you know, gruesome, you know, um, immoral flicks all the time. You can watch something that's pure as well. And people will be concerned about that. So anyway, I just want to let you know about that. And other than that, uh, if you're new here, we welcome you. We'd love to get to know you. And so if you could just fill out a visitor card for us, and you can drop it in the agape box or the wooden boxes around the building. Uh, if you have any prayer needs, we want to pray for you. Like you know, just go ahead and fill out a prayer request. You can drop that in the agape box. And then finally, here at Calvary Chapel, we don't pass an offering plate, though we acknowledge giving is part of worship. And so if you want to honor the Lord in the way that he's provided for you financially, you can do so by bringing your tithes and offerings to those agape boxes. And so with that, let's pray, and let's dive into our study this morning of Colossians chapter 1. Um, Father, we're just thankful that, Lord, you're a firm foundation for our life, a foundation that doesn't get shaken, and it doesn't shake when the mountains shake, and it, it doesn't shake when, you know, um, the fears of man are, are all over the place. Uh, it doesn't change like the seasons or the times, Lord, you remain and even though there's a day coming when you're going to take this earth and you're going to fold it up like an old garment, um, and, and it'll fade away, Lord, but you'll remain and your years fail not. And so thank you, Lord, that our hope is so secure. It rests firmly upon you, Lord Jesus. And today we ask, God, that as we consider your word, that you would speak to us. We want to figure out how we're supposed to live. 
Um, we don't want to just get so caught up with all of the, the temporary fleeing and fleeting passions that we miss out on the joys of that which is forever. Uh, so please, God, bless us today and, and stir our hearts. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, if you live in Hawaii, I'm pretty sure that all over the island that there, everybody has prepared special messages on, like, what to do in event of, you know, a, a missile blast, you know? And, and you know what I mean? Like, it's, like, right there in your face, okay? Like, at, at one point yesterday morning, a question popped through your head, am I going to die today? And uh, you know what? When everything gets shaken like that, you really have to evaluate what your life is built upon. And that's true. You know, you got to figure it out. Who are you? Who are you as a person? And what have you done that matters? Because one day it's all going to go away, no matter what. It's a 100% certainty. We were driving, um, uh, we were, yesterday we were, we were driving towards Kihei and we got stuck in traffic. And in traffic, we're like, man, today is a really interesting day. Like every single person in front of us right now in their, their vehicles, at, today they had to evaluate their life. We don't like to do that. In fact, Solomon tells us that it's better to hang out in funerals than parties because you realize at that point that you're going to die and you better think about it while you still have time. You know, this is just the truth. Um, but today I'm not making a whole message about all that. I just want to bring it up because we're all thinking about it, you know. And I think I'll close with a little bit about that as well. Um, but here, as you see, uh, faith, love, and hope. Wait a minute. That's a reverse order from what I'm used to hearing it in. Because you're used to hearing it in 1 Corinthians, right? Now, these three remain faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That's what it says there in 1 Corinthians 13. I have a friend who had triplets, and her and her husband decided to name their triplets faith, hope, and grace. And in their good wisdom, they chose not to name one of them love, because that one would be going around all the time and say, yeah, you might be faith and hope, but I'm the greatest, because the Bible says the greatest of these is love. Uh, but nonetheless, that triplet of faith, hope, and love appears often in the Bible. And this morning, it does pop up here in our text. And so with that, uh, let's just dive in this morning in verse 3. Verse 3, he says this. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. So verse 3, he starts out just saying, look, we give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praying always for you. I mentioned last week that the book of Colossians is one of four letters written by Paul when he was in prison. Adversity, difficulty, and hardship. That's what he knew. And he knew that for the sake of the gospel. There's this weird idea that is spread through the minds of people that if you just fully believe in Jesus and if you just fully serve him then, like, your finances are going to be fat. You know, like, your pleasures are going to be abundant. You're going to get the best houses, the best cars, the best clothes. And it's this false gospel that is often portrayed as being the prosperity doctrine. That's a lie. Just look at Paul. There has not been a man that I can think of that was more sold out for the cause of Christ, who walked in greater degree of faith than Paul the Apostle. And what did he get in this life for his faith? He got falsely accused just about everywhere he went. He often got beaten. People threw rocks at him at one point to the point where he died and had to get risen again. He, you know, spent a bunch of time, you know, in shipwrecks and, and all, like just all over the place. And here, it's in prison. He's in prison. So personally, he's in a situation that he could have let his mind rob him of a heart that flows with gratitude. See, it's amazing to me how, and maybe you've noticed this, that our own personal hardships and suffering, they have the, the tendency to make us bitter. 
You go through some tough times. You go through a series of tough times. You go, th- go through a series of, of, of things where, you know, you've just been disappointed after disappointed after disappointed. And eventually you get to a place where you're like, it's not even worth it. Something in you changes and you become bitter. And if it's as if we choose in those moments to only look at our disappointment and blind ourselves, literally like gouging out like the eyes of our heart to seeing any good, any other good thing that's in your life. You don't want to look at, yeah, but I have this, or yeah, but my blessings, yeah, but no, you're only looking at your disappointment, and it just dries you up, and it wrecks you. And not only does it wreck you, but it wrecks all those around you, because you carry your bad attitude with you. I know that by experience, and probably one of the most experienced at carrying a bad attitude around, and you know, (laughs) just changing the mood of my family. Do you do that? You go in here and you're just like, all I see and all I dare to see and all I'll let myself see is this thing that I don't like. But here, Paul, in the midst of adversity and hardship and trouble, because he's in prison, and he's in prison for the sake of the gospel, instead of just like turning all inward and bitter, Paul gives thanks. That's beautiful. I give thanks, he says. On top of his own personal struggles and situations, the church there in Colossae was having moral and doctrinal problems. You know, there were these ideas, these heresies, that were so dangerous to the souls of those in Colossae, as well as to the reputation of the gospel. These ideas that were creeping in. Reputation to what the gospel actually is that we're creeping in. You see, I mentioned last, e- last week that ideas have consequences. That there's circumstances are just circumstances, but the ideas by which you interpret those circumstances, they have very dangerous consequences. And if you begin to adopt Um, dangerous ideas, and they're probably not going to be extreme leaps into error. Usually they're incremental. We adopt this little idea to this little idea to this little idea. You don't just all of a sudden, like, boom, have this crazy idea that you turn your whole life around for. It's incrementally towards um, theological heresy. It's more than just your reputation that you're carrying around with you when you bring those ideas around. Let me tell you right now, the continent of Africa has seen revival many times throughout history. Missionaries come, they preach the Bible, they they share the gospel, they see people giving their lives to Jesus, they see you know, people strengthened. They, they see so many beautiful things. But in the early 80s, there became this movement, this movement that's based on these, these prosperity preachers, these word of faith guys that were all experiential. And it, it, it began in the late 80s. Well, maybe the, the, or not the, late, the early 80s. Maybe the late 70s a little bit. But it really took off in the late 80s. Like I said, these prosperity guys. Guys that are welcome regularly at the big church. I'm serious. Their names are there all the time. These guys have probably done more danger to the name of Jesus and the gospel throughout the continent of Africa to where nowadays, if you try to tell somebody in Africa about Jesus, right away they think, you're going to come in and you're going to tell me that if I place my faith in Jesus and in my faith I will sow my seed of faith by giving my finances, that then it's going to come off to me and I will be benefited by it financially. You're telling me that. That's what you're bringing to me and I don't want it because I've watched my preachers get rich and I've watched my family starve. It's a lie. And so that false doctrine, 
with all of its emotionalism and woo, let's get all crazy. Let's have a weird experience. Let's roll on the floor and moan and groan and let's do all of this and now give me your money because that's usually like the high point of it. Okay, if you've had a great experience, now we're gonna take an offering because you know, you want God to keep this blessing alive and that has been propagated throughout the continent. And I'll tell you this, you read your Bible, you don't find that mess. In fact, the early church, they had this very strict code of rule by which they were to accept a traveling missionary or a traveling preacher. And one of the rules is if they ask you for anything, refuse them. Like if your hospitality says to give, then give. But if they ask you for anything, they're not from the Lord. It's crazy to think that, like, wow, my, have things changed where these guys come in as celebrities and they're like, I'm not coming unless you give me, like, the fanciest hotels and, and all of that. But nonetheless, okay, I'm, I'm getting off track. I'm just saying that the ideas that you carry, they're, they're, it's more than just affecting your own personal reputation. It's affecting the reputation of the gospel. And this church was beginning to get all mixed up in that stuff. But it's amazing to me that Paul could still give thanks to God. Even though he's in his adversity, even though they're getting mixed up. You know, sometimes we can focus on the, the error in someone's life to the point to where we lose the capacity to be thankful to the Lord for them. But you know, I just in my mind, I was just imagining like this, like my, my, my children... Sometimes, I don't know how my boys do it, but when they're playing hard, they get their faces so dirty, right? It's almost as if you get so focused on the dirt that you forget the sweet little face that's behind it. And we can get like that with people, where we can become so focused on the dirt that we forget the person that's behind that. And yet, here's Paul, and he gives thanks. He's giving thanks despite his adversity and despite their error. He wasn't filled with self-pity. Oh, poor me. Oh, my condition. He wasn't becoming all pessimistic in his outlook on the Colossians. Oh, no, they might not make it. He exemplified his instruction to others. He practiced what he preached. Like he says there in Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God's will, God's will for your life is thankfulness. You know, there might be things in your life that you can't give thanks for, that specific thing, whatever it is, but you can certainly look beyond that and in the circumstance, there is still plenty to be thankful for. Right? You know, so you like, you bust your leg. Thank you, Lord, for this broken leg. No, like, you know, like, oh man, my leg is broken. But thank you, Lord, that even in this, there is so much for me to have gratitude in. Right? I mean, and God, it's his, his will for you to be overflowing with gratitude. We have so much to be thankful for. So try to look at the things that we have to be thankful for a little more often. Like it says in Psalm 92, verse 1 and 2, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. It is good to do that. But we shouldn't just be thankful. We need to be prayerful as well. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, but, to the e but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Uh, you know, I think you're at a place right now where you realize, hey, the end of all things can be like that. You know, when, when that alert came in yesterday, I was thinking, okay, what, what not, only, not only what does that mean for us, but what if it's real, and what, what is our reaction going to be as a nation? Like, is this the moment where, like, rockets begin to fly? This is crazy. And that's just the potentiality of war. Everybody 
wants to, seems to want to ignore the fact that the systems of the earth in nature that we are so dependent upon are beginning to change. You know, things that we rely upon daily are beginning to wear out. I mean, yeah, like, the world can't go on like it is forever. The end of all things is at hand. But we like to live like things are just going to go on forever. And I can keep playing forever. And I can keep pretending forever. But man, when, you, when the brevity of life kicks in, there has to be a seriousness. So therefore, be serious. And watchful in prayer. Be specific in your prayer. Like Paul himself exhorts us later in this book, in Colossians 4.2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Oh, by the way, there's that little couple again. Prayer and thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and prayer. A prayerful, prayerful heart is going to be a thankful heart. A heart that doesn't pray doesn't see the answers to those prayers. A heart that doesn't pray, they, I don't know what they're blaming it on. Serendipity. You know, like whatever it might be. I don't know what it is. But when you're praying and you see God come through, you're like, wow, thank you, Lord. You did that. In the midst of what I didn't see could happen, you made it happen. In the, the, the way where I didn't see a way, you made a way. And then in verse 4, we see the cause of Paul's thanksgiving. Um, sorry, there in verse 4. He says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. They'd heard a good report from Colossae. They heard good news. A good word. And what's that good word from Colossae? There's believers in Colossae. What? How'd that happen? See, Paul never went to go plant the church in Colossae. He never had any ministry there, but yet there were believers there. God, through his own way, had got this little church going in this area of Colossae. And these guys, these guys had faith. You know, the Bible speaks of having faith toward the Lord Jesus. The direction of your soul. When you're, or in your heart, you come to that place where it's just settled confidence that nothing else can save you. You know, as long as you're kind of playing the game, you might be thinking, you know, what can save me is you know, my health. You know, it can save me, you know, um, a new career. You know what can save me? What, what, can, like, what can fix me? What can fulfill me? What can bring purpose into my existence? This or this or this. And you're looking at all of these other things, or maybe it's kind of a, a, like a, a trail mix of things. You know, and you're like, I don't like this in my trail mix, and I don't like that in my trail mix, but I do like this, this, and this. And that is what is eventually going to make it all come together and... There we go. What's going to save me? Well, my retirement package will save me. You know, what's going to save me? And, and we look to this and that and that. But the Bible calls us towards faith, or to faith toward the Lord Jesus. Where you begin to realize, hey, none of that stuff can save me. None of those is worth my hope. Like when Paul preached in Ephesus in Acts 20, 20 and 21, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The direction of your soul is, it's you, Lord. Faith towards you. The Bible also speaks to us about faith on the Lord Jesus. The idea of, of laying down your burden, of, of, of resting, leaning, or, or learning to lean in. Not just knowing that he can, not just putting your faith toward him like, okay, you're the way, and I get that. 
but it's actually like the act of surrender. I am now surrendering myself to you. Faith on the Lord Jesus. Like when Paul preached at Philippi in Acts 16, 30 and 31, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. So faith toward the Lord Jesus. Here it's believe on the Lord Jesus. But here in Colossians... It isn't faith toward. It isn't faith on. Though those things are implied, here it's faith in the Lord Jesus. They were actively trusting in him. They were abiding in him. It wasn't just something that they had acknowledged. It wasn't just something that they had done in the past. I believed on him. No, they had faith in him. Active, persistent, abiding faith in the Lord Jesus. Let me ask you, can we describe your faith today as faith in the Lord Jesus? Or would it just be, I have had faith toward the Lord Jesus. I had faith on him. But today, is it active? Is it pursuing? Is it persistent? Is it abiding? Is it faith in the Lord Jesus? When Paul heard that their faith was in the Lord Jesus, active, persistent, pursuing, he was thankful. There was so much gratitude in his heart. He heard of their faith, but that wasn't the only thing he was thankful for. He had also heard of their love toward one another. The order there is significant. Faith in and love toward. If you're going to have this kind of love, this kind of love toward people, it's the word agape, by the way, which is like this selfless, giving, um, sacrificial love. If you're going to have that kind of love, it flows from a source. Love is the product of faith in. It's the result of an abiding relationship with Jesus. As he says there in um, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And then in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. This is the product of an abiding relationship of faith in Jesus. And what is the product? The product is love. Walking in love. The product is joy, walking in joy, walking in peace, walking in long suffering. How long suffering does it have to be? It's long. It just keeps going. Don't, you know, the, the question of when does this suffering stop doesn't even come up. It's just there's that, that active patience. Uh, kindness. That's the byproduct of the Spirit. Are you kind? Do you have faith in the Lord Jesus? If you're actively pursuing Him in faith, Kindness will be the the fruit of your life. Gentleness, self-control. And so with this, Paul was grateful that there was faith in the Lord Jesus, but he was grateful that it was evidenced, demonstrated by their attitudes that they had towards one another. And when you hear of that happening, man, those guys, that church is packed. You'd be like, oh, cool. And what's that church packed with? Well, they, those guys, they go to church, and then they leave. And when the guys, that are, their businessmen go back to that church, or when they, the businessmen that go to that church, when they go out to the workplace, yeah, they just exploit people. They just use their power to just drive people down all kinds of corrupt business practices, but they go to church. 
Oh yeah, those lawyers that go to that church, when they go back to practice their law, they don't do what's right. They do what's going to make them the most money. But they go to church. You know, all those people, when they go to church, after they leave church, they go back and they just, they cut every corner they can. They just live immoral. I saw so-and-so and I watched him go to the bar. or what, You know, like whatever the, 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 the impression is of church attendance, if it's not equated into the, the ways that you live in society and community, it means very little. Just like James said, you say you believe. You show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And then we'll see whose faith is more legit. Because true faith will have accompanying works with it. And when you hear of that happening, man, they don't just go to church. They're living like Christians. Now that's special. It's always a cause for thanksgiving. And so they had faith and they had love, but they also had hope. Look at verses 5 through 8. He says this, once I find it, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it is also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. They had faith in the Lord Jesus. They had love toward one another. And here he says, because of the hope which is laid up for you. Their hope. Now, hope can be somewhat of a touchy word if you think about it. Uh, it, it, it. How often has your hope come through for you? I mean, seriously, it, it, hope, it, it's like it holds out these prizes that you never win. Hope, it, it holds out these goals that you never reach. You know, there's that expression, oh, I got my hopes up. And it's there because it's, it speaks of that idea of you get your hopes up only to get let down. When it comes to hope, we either don't get what we hoped for, totally missing out on it, or when we get it, we find out that it wasn't all that we thought it was going to be. You hope, and then, oh, it didn't happen. Or you hope, and then it happens, you're like, that's not what I thought it was. Ah, and over and over and over again. And so if we think of all the lies that our concept of hope has told us, if we think of all the energy that we've wasted on it, it would almost make us question if, you know, is hope even worth anything at all? Because I think we've all been at that, you know, like this idea of hope only to be let down, only to be disappointed. And despite all of those disappointments, hope seems to keep us going. Where, well, what's the next thing I can hope in? And even the oldest person just keeps pressing on with hope. Now, there is a true form of hope that doesn't disappoint. And that's gospel hope. The hope of the gospel is certain. See, our problem with hope is often, we've made hope more about the feeling rather than the object. The feeling of hope isn't the substance. And yet we kind of live in a world that wants to deny the substance of things. 
Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We make hope all about the feeling rather than about the substance. Here's the substance of our hope. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Our hope. It began with a miracle. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Your hope began with that miracle of new birth, being born again by the Spirit of God, where once you were dead, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and yet by his Spirit, he made you alive in Christ. Your hope began with a miracle. If you are born again today, know that it's because of a miracle of God. Not because of some intellectual assent, but because the Spirit of God himself changed you where you yourself were powerless to change. It began with a miracle, and it has as its basis a solid foundation. Look, he begot, he's begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Solid foundation, the solid foundation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I had this friend in high school, and he asked me one time after I'd given my life to the Lord, he was just like, Sean, I just don't get it. Because he'd had this problem with hope before too. He's like, you know, how do I know that there's heaven after I die. How do I know? And at that point, I didn't know how to answer him. I kind of, I remember thinking something about, I, I, I gave him some sorry answer about like, you know, computer hardware and software and how it's, the hardware is just parts for the software and he's like, I don't get it. And I didn't know what I was talking about anyway. <laughs> I was a new believer, right? But now I know. All I ever had to say to him when he's like, how do I know that there's heaven when I die? I could have said, well, because Jesus died and he came back. If anybody has the right to tell you what happens when they die, it's not just the one that, you know, his heart stopped beating on the operating table and then they resuscitated him. Not just the one that they revived, like the life was there and they brought him back. No, the one who was dead and was dead for three days, he wasn't just like sort of dead. He was dead dead. Hebrews 2 tells us that he tasted to the point of becoming an expert on the subject, death for every man. He died for us. And he conquered the grave for us. The resurrection is proof to all the claims that Jesus made. The fact that he is God's only son. The resurrection is proof to that. That he is the only way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. The idea that Jesus is a way, if he was just a way, and yet he's saying he's the way, and yet he was risen from the dead by the power of God, then God is advocating lies. God does not advocate lies. Satan is the author of lies. He is the source of all truth. And when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and then that was with this resounding amen of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection is proof positive of everything that he ever said. That he is the embodiment of all truth, the only source of real life, and the fact that he's still alive today, all based on the resurrection. 
So the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is a living hope because our Savior is alive. Our hope is risen and our hope is ascended into heaven for us. As it says in Hebrews 6, 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. An anchor for the soul. That's so beautiful, like that that your soul is so prone to being tossed and, and thrown all around. But hope anchors your soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. Another thing I think of, sorry, this is just me thinking. When you anchor a boat, you got to be smart on how you anchor that boat. You know that? Because especially out here, you anchor a boat, and if the tide goes up, and you've anchored it tight when it was low tide, your anchor sinks your boat. If you anchor your boat, and like the storms come in, and big old waves start happening, and you run out of rope, your anchor sinks your boat. It's just amazing to think that like, in the times of great storm, to have an anchor is dangerous. That's why whenever there's going to be a big storm or whether there's a tsunami, people, they pull up anchor and they take their boat out. They try to get away from that stuff because they know how devastating it can be to their ship. But our anchor goes into heaven. And how beautiful is that? Like, hey, man, the tides are rising. That's okay. My anchor's in heaven. Hey, man, the storms are coming. Perfect. I'm just going to swing here on my anchor. You know what I mean? Like, my hope is in heaven. My soul is anchored. I am set. As Paul says in Timothy 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Your hope isn't a thing. Your hope isn't a feeling. Your hope is not an emotion. Your hope is the Lord himself. As it says in Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So let me just tell you something about what your hope ought to be or what it can be. What's available to you if you are walking with faith in the Lord Jesus? That your hope is of such solid substance that you could rest the weight of the entire world upon it. And you know what hope like that does? Verse 6. Verse 6 says this. Which has Come to you as it is also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. Hope like that produces fruit. Your hope is as powerful as the resurrection. Your hope is as powerful as God himself. Because your hope is nothing short of God himself. He is your hope. Psalm 39 verse 7. And now Lord what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Salvation. That living hope of ours that's reserved in heaven for us. It's the very core of Christianity. Faith in that produces love and hope. It was for our salvation that Jesus Christ came to this earth. As a man, that he lived here as a servant, that he became that lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Like John said there in John 1.29, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In fact, the entire Bible is this, you know, account of the history of salvation as God has just been working towards that purpose. Salvation is the greatest of all blessings. It beats money. It beats friends. 
It beats health. There's nothing in this world that can even compare to it. And proof positive of that is what happened in your soul when you got an alert that says this is not a drill? Seek immediate shelter. What was your refuge? Suddenly your house just didn't seem enough. Suddenly your fancy TVs, your fancy cars, your life's pursuits of education and career, your, you know, your 401ks, your medical insurance packages, all of these things that you've tended to look towards as security just didn't seem enough. The bottom dropped out if that's your foundation. Nothing can compare to the hope that we have in Christ. It doesn't just set you free from hell. It provides for every human need. It delivers from the slavery of alcohol. It delivers from the bondage of lust. It delivers from, you know, giving us victory over greed and hate and fear and bitterness and despair. It gives us victory, salvation. It brings joy in the face of suffering and brings joy in the face of fear. And like I said, yesterday when that alert came in, you suddenly had to evaluate everything you'd been hoping in. And I'm wondering, was there a huge change in your heart? Did it unhinge you? Did it get you to this place of just like, I can't control my emotions right now? Or was it just like, hey, my change is coming? I mean, I sat there yesterday. We were all kind of held up in a, in a stairwell between our house and um, Charlie and Holly's house. We, we live in a duplex and share a stairwell, and we're all up there kind of together. Hannah's reading the Bible. I'm sitting there kissing my daughter on the forehead, and I'm just like so excited because I'm thinking like, no matter what, all it's going to be is a change. Like, this is, this is cool. This is good. It's fine. And after it was all done, I saw Charlie out in the driveway. He had his cup of coffee. I had my cup of coffee. And I gave him a little cheers. And I said, hey, Charlie, I saw you face the potential of certain death. I saw you face it as a Christian. You didn't act any different. Your hope isn't built on the things that bombs can take away. Good job, buddy. <laughs> and he's like, likewise. <laughs> and it was just neat to realize, like, man, like, even when everything's falling apart, like, nothing's really falling apart because nothing that I'm built on is going away. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, even death is your friend. It's yours. It, it just ushers you into the presence of your Savior. Man, that's a hope that doesn't disappoint. And so, yesterday, you may have said some prayers thinking you were getting ready to die. But in, real, in reality, God was just giving you a wake-up call. Your prayers weren't just preparing you to die. Did you mean those prayers? Because if you did, it was a preparation on how you're supposed to live. Not just faith towards the Lord Jesus and not just faith on him. But today it's, it's time to start having faith in him. That consistent, you know, persistent faith. Actively abiding daily in the reality of all that you, you say you believe it. Walk in it and live. Turn your faith towards him. Place your faith on him. But walk in that faith that you have in him. And know that everything else is moving. Everything else is fading. 
Everything else is failing. Even the good, the best of the good things that God has made in this side of eternity will change, will decay, will go away. But God himself is eternal. And if your hope is in him, your hope does not change. So we have faith here. And we have love here. But I want to know what your hope is in. You need to be sure about that. And so with that, turn your attention to the Lord and let's pray. Father, this morning we look to you. Thank you for how good you are, God. Thank you for how real your promises are. And we thank you for how imminent your return is. Lord, when you come, that's it. And it's been appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And at that point, it'll be too late. Too late to change. Too late to, you know, get right with those that we've offended. But we do have right now. And right now, Lord, we want to make this moment count for forever. That it would be a moment where by your spirit, you bring a a miracle in our life. It sets us on a new course. And that we wouldn't soon forget. that basic reality that that this stuff here doesn't last forever but you do we want our hope to be in you you know this morning I just want to give you guys a chance if you're at a place where you're like you know I've been playing games and I need to give my heart fully to the Lord and I just I need to do that publicly and boldly then I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand Um, it's time to Invite Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. We just give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Will you stand with us as we sing this last song? Sin of the world, he 
His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Every knee will bow before him Who can stop the world, oh Bless you guys. Have a blessed week.